Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, general ladies, welcome to Tatami Talk. My name is Juan. This is my two coming partner, Anthony. It's a judo podcast for judo players by two judo players. Now, today we have a very special guest. We have Carrie Chandler. The, she was a national team member. She was also an Olympic uh, alternate, I believe. Mm-hmm. But uh, one thing we're going to have on here that she is, is that she's actually the manager of her significant other, um, Nick DiPopolo. So with no further ado, let's go into the interview. Hello, everybody. So here with our interview right now with Carrie Chandler. If you don't know her, she's actually the manager for uh, Nick DiPopolo. And we're going to talk about like funding, how it is being a judo manager, and also not just being his manager, but also being his significant other at the same time. That's right. Almost 13 years. uh, Wow. (laughs) So, Carrie, can you explain to our audience, um, you know, just how'd you get into martial arts and how'd you pick judo? Okay, so I have seven brothers and sisters, and um, obviously with a family of eight kids, sports are very expensive. So my dad actually taught judo. He owned uh, the Dalton Judo Club, which is like a small judo club in our community. And so I've been around it my whole life. I did it when, because it was free, like, because, so they were like, yeah, do judo. Like, we don't have to pay, you know, for eight of you to do You can't beat free. You can't beat that. (laughs) So I uh, was always around the dojo. I did it for a year when I was like, five and then I like I don't know I I can't even remember I stopped doing it and then when I was um in high school I uh was at was in a fight with my mom and my dad pulled up to take my brother to judo and I just jumped in the car too and I was uh I think I was 16 almost 17 and that's when I started like for real I started it and I fell in love with it and I was like dad I want to be really good at this like how do I get Mm -hmm. good you know what what's the next step and he's like well you know, we lived in Massachusetts and he's like, I know this guy, Jason Morris, he's a four-time Olympian and he is, uh, he just retired. Actually at the time he was a three-time Olympian, um, and, but he was retired and he was like, he's opened a club and they, he lives an hour and a half away in Scotia, New York. So we would uh, drive there. We actually, I was like one of Jason's first students. Like he started his dojo with me and a couple other kids from my club, my dad's club. Um, and my dad was like, so just so excited. He, oh, he's this big sports guy. So he was just so excited that we, he could like have this Olympian teaching all his kids. And then we started going over three times a week. It was an hour and a half drive, two hour practice, hour and a half drive home. And then is this um, his current dojo in, in upstate New York that. Yeah. So yeah. when, um, when I started with him, we were actually out of his garage um, oh, okay. in his house for years. So like I started with him in 99 and then he opened the, the big dojo in 2006. So I was almost, and I retired in 2008. So, um, toward the end is when he like, uh, you know, made it big, made the big dojo. Um, but yes, Mm -hmm. so it was really cool there. It just just got so big. Like we were actually in his house. Like he had a finished basement and then he had like, um, I don't know, like a one to Tommy sized area. And it (laughs) just like, it was, it was a little at first. And then like, it was so packed. He just had to expand. So, so you got the authentic Japanese experience, like, (laughs) yes, totally. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> absolutely. That sounds so much fun. It sounds so interesting. Yeah, it was really great. It was fun. So I know one of the big things that's going to be very interesting is like, how did um, you and Nick Dick get together? Okay. That's a very interesting so, dynamic, I yes, think. Yes, <laughs> yes. And at the end, you know, I'm seven years older than Nick. So like, uh, I was like the big stud and he was just like this little turd, <laughs> nothing. Um, and I used to, uh, but he, he would, he's from New Jersey, but he would train at Jason's also. So like, I knew him. I've known him his whole life and like we've known each other basically since I was probably eight, 16, 18. I can't remember when I was really young um, and he was 12. And then he was like this tough kid from New Jersey who kept coming mm-hmm. and he actually moved into Jason's house as I did. This girl Liz from Arizona did. Jason had like five or six kids living in his house and Nick moved there um, and he went to eighth grade in Scotia, New York. And we were like really close. I would always bring him to be my um, little partner if I did like demos and stuff. And then uh, I think after he graduated eighth grade, he his parents decided like it was too hard. They adopted him. So it was like really hard for them to like let him go. Um, And they Mm -hmm. were uh, a lot older. So they just like adopted this kid. And then 10 years later, like he was already not living with them. So they brought him back to New Jersey and we were all Mm -hmm. like devastated. And he um started wrestling and he wrestled for bergen catholic high school uh which is like a really well-known high school in new jersey they have great wrestlers and uh he was gone for like 
three or four years. And then he came back. Uh, and I think just, I think he was 17 when he came back and I was number one in the country at the time. And so, but I had a lot of injuries. So like I, people mm-hmm. would always want me to do clinics, but I couldn't take the fall. So I, I would always need like a throwing dummy. Oh, can I swear yeah. on this podcast or is yeah, that not, not kosher? So I like to say nah, Nick, was like, <laughs> Nick was like my, my throwing bitch. Like I would bring him to these <laughs> clinics and I would just throw him around and like, uh, so we started traveling and then like he graduated high school and I would still bring him around. I really liked him um, just as a person. And then like mm-hmm. he uh, just after he turned 19, he asked me out on this date and I was 26 at the time. And I was like, no way. <laughs> I was like, there's no way I'll go on a date with you. Nick. And, and he was it like, sounds so Star Wars to me. <laughs> it just was so I, I was just like, but it was, I mean, it was just funny. But we, we were really close. Like he he we would travel around and like to Yorkville, Illinois, like really remote places to teach these clinics. And we would just have nothing to do is so we talk, talk to each other a lot, knew everything about each other. Like you, you fight and die out there with each other. So we're like bleeding and sweating, getting injured with each other and, you know, watching each other compete. It's really emotional and dramatic. So anyway, when, after he turned 19, like, I think it was on his 19th birthday, he asked me out on this date and I said no. And then he kept saying like, well, why, why? And I basically just said like, you're, cause you're too young. And he was like, well, that's the one thing that I can't change. So that's not really uh-huh. fair. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> Nick Tell like I'll go on a date with you. So he took me to Applebee's and- uh, Oh man, fancy. Yeah. He went all out. Oh my God. Uh, I think that's fancy. <laughs> that's fancy for a 19 year old <laughs> Doka. Hey, I don't know, I don't know. You gotta impress a girl better. <laughs> and we have literally been together ever since. Like I remember for the first like year, maybe less than a year. I like to be dramatic. So I'm going to say a year. Like for the first year, I wouldn't let him tell anyone we were dating. Cause I was so sure I was just having a fling with this hot younger guy. I was like, this is not going to last, you know, like there's uh-huh. no way. And, you know, of course, obviously now we're coming up on 13 years together. So, um, wow. Just my best friend, the love, total love of my life. And he just happens to be seven years younger. So that it is what it is. But now it's like not weird when he was 19 and I was 26. I was like, Oh my God. But now like we're both in our thirties. So it's like <laughs> totally fine. You know, it's better now. <laughs> it's better. It's better. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. So one of the main things is that you're actually Nick's manager. We talked about that. Yes. Now, how did that come about that? You're at the end of your career. You're winding down. Yep. And were you just like, you know, I want to see this guy do better than I did or just want to manage yes. him better than you felt yes. you were managed? Mm-hmm. That's exactly what happened. I, um, so I, I was wanting to be an Olympian so bad, like more than anything. Mm. Like I still can't, like I'll get nightmares sometimes. And it's like, it's hard. And people think it's cool when you say like you're an Olympic alternate and it's not cool. It's not cool for the alternate. Like it's, yeah. it's not cool when you're the number two, you know? So like I, um, it just crushed me. And I just thought I did a lot of reflecting. Like I was too injured to carry on. Like I had a total shoulder replacement. I knew I was going to be finished. So like, I just thought like, I'm not going to let, I, I just thought like, what could I have done better? What if I just did this, if I went to Japan more, like I didn't really trade in Japan. Like maybe if I worked with Jimmy Pedro more, he didn't really work mm-hmm. with me that I could have made it. And so I just was like, I'm not going to let anything that happened to me. I'm going to have no regrets with Nick. And I was like, I'm going to f- like pour myself into dedicating like his whole competition life into us never having any regrets. And it's, I'm so proud of it. Cause we really don't, we don't have any regrets. Like we, um, we just, a lot of times, like when I was coming up, I would be afraid to speak out. Like I, I wouldn't get funding and I would be like, well, wait a minute, this isn't fair. Or there was no clear cut criteria. Like I would be number one and they would give the number two girl funding or something. And I would be like, well, this isn't fair. But I would, people, mm-hmm. I would, I would not make waves because people were like, Oh, don't make waves. Like, don't do this. Don't speak out. And so I wouldn't, and I'm a really outspoken person, but I just was like afraid, you know, and I didn't really know what I was afraid of them, you know, who's them. And, um, I just was like, yeah, that's nothing. That's not going to happen with you. And like, I, um, that's how I did it. Also on the financial side, like I, uh, was like, well, you're never going to miss a tournament because the funding was so important. So I, launched his website nickdelpablo.com and he like didn't want to do it he didn't he's so like he's so annoying like he doesn't want to do uh (laughs) anything at the beginning he's like such a not negative person but he's such like a scaredy like no no like he didn't want a poster he didn't want a facebook fan page he didn't want a website didn't want Mm -hmm. all this stuff and i like then we do it and it's so cool and he's like oh yeah i guess that's okay and so like i um (laughs) early on like i think in 2010 i launched his website and we did we did this funding campaign i got this donor um shout out he um he don't you know what 
actually edit that out because I think he was a, a silent donor. Okay. But okay. anyway, uh, <laughs> anyways, we got Make this donor. Note. Yes, <laughs> we get, it's, even if you leave it in, it's fine. Uh, we got this donor um, to donate $5,000. So I did a donor match and mm-hmm. um, we were able to raise more than an additional 5,000. So like right off, right at the beginning, um, you know, we raised over $10,000. And so he had a little nest egg to start competing. And, it, and at that time, if you can get to number one, usually it, there's a lot less uh, pressure financially. Now it's not really the case. And even then sometimes it wasn't the case, but he, we like did what we had to do. And I was always like, you know, getting him out and doing clinics and doing, uh, get, just having a big online presence and branding. And I'm just making it up. Like I have a fifth grade education. I'm not, I didn't know like what I was doing, you know, like I just like, you just learned just, on the fly. I just learned on the yeah. fly and I just yeah. did it. And I knew it was important to like beat the drum and just like, you know, put yourself out there. And so like he um, would do all these clinics and stuff and we would build up such a strong community of uh, just different clubs that he would go to all over the country. And he um, has, it, that's flourished. I mean, over the last decade, we've we've gone back and back and back to these clubs and that's how he has raised like a ton of money to compete um, internationally. Mm. So it's wow. awesome. That just that whole story you told gave me. Just, I I, th- I think we talked about it before that we didn't come prepared with any questions. Yeah, that's but okay. I'm, that's I'm, that story, I have like ten <laughs> questions in my head. Just oh, go ahead. I'm sure. I'm sure. Me having a fifth grade education is one of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so first thing is when it comes to funding. So let's start off with this. How how much do you think? if you don't mind rep- responding to this, that other no, people have responded to this question already, but how much do you think Nick has spent throughout his oh. career so far on just traveling and competing and judo? Well, I know. So we got a really serious sponsor after London and before the Rio run up. And this okay. guy helped with everything. He helped with like bills at home, uh, school, just so Nick could tr- completely train full time. And I think at the end of that, he had spent uh, just under 300,000. And that was just from, Wow. Like, like actually it was probably this January of 2013 till, uh, after the Olympics in 2016. And so that I honestly, a lot of people like think like you can skate by and you know, 10 or 20 grand a year, but you really can't. It's like 80, it costs yeah. like $80,000 a year, 50 to 80. It just depends on like how good you are and, and you know, what kind of, um, tournaments, what kind of schedule you have. But if you want to do this full time and you want to, um, and you want to make an Olympic run, like you have to be prepared to spend at least $50,000 a year. And then like, of course, mm-hmm. so that means you're training full time. So that means like, well, who's going to pay your bills at home? Yeah. Obviously, you, yeah. you know, you have a home, so you have to take that into account as well. So it's, it's a ton of money. Okay. So, um, and you mentioned you're doing the clinics how, about, about how many clinics did you do you do a year typically? Um, anywhere from 10 to 12. Um, and then like, yeah, I would say is that about one, once a month. Yes. And then sometimes like at the beginning, so he wasn't Nick Del Popolo two time Olympian. He was just like Nick Del Popolo with a nice Uchi Mata. So like he wasn't, you know, he wasn't bringing in as much, yeah. uh, money. I think uh, when he first started doing clinics, he was charging like 500. I, I remember. And like at the beginning we would buy our own plane tickets. And so sometimes we wouldn't even break even, or I would, yeah. I would, if I yeah. would even go, like we would have to buy our tickets and then like all these, these club owners or good people, but they just didn't really do the leg work. And then it's all these people that said like, yeah, I'll come. They're not there. You yeah, were leaving. Yeah. We've made like 200 bucks. And we're like, Oh my God, like we have to pay you. I said, you know, $2,000 tomorrow. Like what are we going to do? Oh so um, it, it was hard at the beginning, but then like, as he got better and you know, he just became more known than, and I got better as the manager too, then I would say, okay, plane ticket up front, $1,500 minimum. And, and, you know, now he charges 2,500 for a full clinic, uh, 1,500 for a half clinic. And um, I think that's super fair, you know, for a two-time Olympian and, and, and everyone seems to be okay with paying it. It's, it's really about getting 20 to 30 people to pay $50. It covers his, all of his expenses, you know? And so you really um, try to work with the club owners to help build it up, make flyers and promote it on our end and on their end, you know, generate interest. So. You should just start charging more and then handle all of that yourself. Cause then <laughs> yeah. like you said, a lot of club owners don't know how to market or set yeah. these things up. Right. I know. So. I know. It's so true. I, you know, another thing that I've thought about doing, um, I'm just not quite sure how I would do it, but I thought about doing this for other athletes and like, just being like a manager, taking like 10% or, and just mm-hmm. setting up everything. But 
I, I don't really know why. I don't really have a reason that I haven't done. I just think I haven't wanted to take that on. But that's something that I thought about doing, too, to help uh, these kids. Because I was such a poor kid. Like, I, I yeah. didn't have anything. And I just really hate when you know, some kid can't get an opportunity because he can't afford to to fly to Uzbekistan, you know, or Paris. Yeah. And it just, it's so hard because it's like, it just sucks. And I just, so it really hits me in the feels. I hate um, the whole funding thing. Mm-hmm. It just drives me nuts. So uh, keeping on the topic of the, the clinics, um, you've been doing it for quite a while and we know the judo numbers, participant numbers have been dropping in America. So how have you seen the change in the number of clinics being done and number of attendees and the well, amount of money that you're bringing in that way? I, I, I No, I would say it's increased just because like Nick has grown, you know, and then mm-hmm. I've, like I said, I've gotten better at uh, building it up. So, so we're oh, pretty sure it's going to be very successful. I mean, he went to Wyoming and our friend Justin Smith runs the Platte River Judo Club. He started the club in the in Y and it's like, I don't even know how many people live in Wyoming, much less do judo. And he yeah. had Justin, this was, um, this was last January, just before uh, the pandemic. That was Nick's last clinic. And Justin had like 60 kids on the mat. He contacted wow. Pe- wow. people from Denver, drove up. It's a four hour drive mm-hmm. to Casper, Wyoming. And all these other clubs came in. He had the news people there. A lot of times when Nick will do a <laughs> clinic, great. like they'll wow. bring the local news. So like, it was, mm-hmm. it was great. So fortunately we've not seen um, a, a decrease in, in clinic numbers, but mm-hmm. um, you know, that's just like, we, we haven't done one since the pandemic. So I, I don't know. We, we've done a lot of zoom clinics though. So, uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that seems like the total opposite of what I heard from Travis, unless I misunderstood what Travis is saying. He, he was talking about on his YouTube channel about how people just don't show up to these clinics and he would barely break even. Because yeah. I think, showing up. well, I think they're, I'm not sure, but, uh, from what I heard about project 2024, I think they were charging $10,000 per clinic. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, the, the number is like so much higher, you know, Nick's clinics are the, the set fees are not, we don't do that. We don't charge that. I'm not, um, bashing project 2024. They've mm-hmm. got to seem like they have a good system, but I think like if you spend $10,000 to me, to bring somebody in, um, then you're going to have to be charging kids $150, $200 yeah. per person. And that is so much of a bigger ask. And then, um, and then when you do that kind of thing to me, it seems like, like you do it, you beat the drum, you get everybody to come, but it's like, you can't do it again six months yeah. later. So yeah, like your, yeah. your window gets smaller and smaller as you have done that. I, I just think that's a hard thing to repeat. Um, so maybe that's, maybe the financial part is why, um, but I, I can't, you know, I'm not sure, but, um, that would just be one of my guesses. I went to a Neil Adams clinic and f- only thing I was thinking about the whole time is how much did they pay him to come out here? <laughs> <laughs> was it one of the Project 2024 ones? No, it or wasn't. Was it? It was, oh, wait, it was, was this a, at Henry Hummels? In uh, Ma- no, uh, Wisconsin? I, they did go to, they did go there, but I think okay. he, he did a tour in America. He was in, um, I want to say Orange County, I think it was. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. he went to Orange County. I, th- yeah. I think it was Orange County, County Kodokan, was it? Something yeah, like I think that. it was there. Yeah. I think that the tour, and again, Neil is like so famous in judo, so yeah. he he has a lot of pull, you know, like he's the voice of judo. Like I mm. grew up listening to him <laughs> narrate the 101 Epone videos, you know, I'm sure <laughs> oh, he yeah. too. So yep. um, he's he's a big draw, but what, he, what these bigger guys do, and what I've done with Nick, um, and I see like, Jason has done this in California is they make a tour. So like, even if they're making a smaller number, they're hitting 10 locations Mm -hmm. in, you know, a week and like, Mm -hmm. you know, probably clearing, I I would guess at least a thousand each place, if not more. Um, So it's Mm -hmm. worth their while, you know? So it's like, there's not all that pressure on one club to deliver these huge numbers. Well, Neil told me that his daughter wanted to go to Disneyland. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's why he came to California. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. Yeah, because people are lining up to take pictures and get his autograph. And he's like, uh, can we hurry this up? Like, I got to go pick up my daughter from Disneyland. <laughs> uh, oh, he didn't even go with her. That's no, not got to yeah. work. Oh, that's, that's really funny. <laughs> So you talk about going to these uh, judo clubs and I've noticed that I've got questions. I've had, I've got people ask me this too, but have you guys been open up to go to like jujitsu clubs, like BJJ clubs or MMA clubs and doing clinics for judo? Mm -hmm. Okay. So great question. Not to bash uh, judo, but BJJ clubs are there. It's always, sorry, my cat's uh, walking. (laughs) Um, BJJ clubs have their stuff together, man. They, they, I would rather 10 times out of 10, if I book a clinic, I'd rather book 
a uh, BJJ a clinic, a judo for BJJ clinic because mm-hmm. the the owners like their their infrastructure and how they advertise and how they get numbers and how they the tide rises all boats and like they people aren't afraid to charge and I think judo people it used to be this like. Uh, almost volunteer thing my dad never charged yeah. people i think he would pay to keep the lights on and it's like yeah. bjj people are like no this guy's the best in the world the clinic's a hundred dollars it's one hour like mm-hmm. it's extra money for questions you know just kidding but it's yeah. like they have no problem and then the their audience like have has no problem paying that and so i think mm-hmm. that um that might be part of it but man do i love doing uh bjj clinics like they're always packed they're always uh great they bring their notebooks and they're always like we so we've done so many where we started off uh we go to crazy 80 bjj in uh, maryland a lot and Mm -hmm. i remember at the beginning nick was like man uh this guy sensei julius is the owner he's like julius you don't really need me like you're you're you know if they're just learning judo and i'm basically they don't know any stand-up you don't need nick del popolo olympian i could just call some guys in the area and he's like no they're paying for the experience he's like oh, yes yeah. they want to learn from yeah. nick del popolo the olympian so like mm-hmm. it, it's really cool they i love bjj people have a great thing going on uh, with their infrastructure one of the first yeah. clinics i went to was actually a bjj clinic and mm-hmm. i wasn't training bjj my i was training muay thai and my muay thai instructor was a bjj black belt and he's like oh you train judo you should go to this thing and it's i'm not going to name which gracie it is but it was like 150 or 200 yes. bucks like you said and you paid it. yeah and i bet there i bet it was packed i bet it was it packed. was packed but yeah. it was not it was more like an autograph and meet your uh wow. your, your <laughs> idol yeah. kind of yeah. session versus mm-hmm. actually learning anything useful yeah um yeah, that, I'm, yeah i won't go into detail i didn't really learn anything and that's, i had to say yeah. yeah that's something that we try really hard to uh to like you just said like oh it wasn't you didn't get anything from it like we try really hard to do the opposite like um if you i want everyone to leave nick's clinics feeling like they learned something and he's such a good instructor and i think that um i like to take credit for that because he's been literally teaching since he was like 12 because of me uh so like but he just like someone told us once like when you teach you have to act as if you're speaking to someone who's blind okay you can't just say put this here, do that. You have to say, take your left hand, grab their right lapel, like just that kind of stuff. And just like, Mm -hmm. um, he is really able to like get down to like the kids levels or get up to elite black belt levels. Like, and he can, he can teach, um, to where everybody's understanding and feeling like good about it and not just like, you know, appeasing. I'm like, yeah, I got it. Just he, like, you really have to do it. We make you demo in front of the group. That's like a big thing we do at uh, his clinics is like, he'll teach then the group will come together and like, if everyone, you know, five or six people come out and demo and like at, by the end of the day, everyone's come out and demoed. So like, he's sure mm-hmm. they know how to do it. So, so. Yeah. as he, in, in some other martial arts, they, they make you teach as a way to improve yourself. Have you noticed, I don't want you to put words in his mouth, but have you noticed his judo <laughs> improving yeah. because since he started teaching and holding these clinics? Absolutely. It's not, and I wouldn't even be putting words in his mouth because he said it, like he said it before. Yeah. I think teaching makes you a better instructor because like you can't get, it's so hard to talk to like a six-year-old, you know, we run this judo after school program now. So we got a bunch mm-hmm. of five, six, even some four-year-olds. And it's like, it's very hard. You have to make them understand it. So then like, you're if you're getting frustrated that they're not learning it you're like well what am i doing what how can i say this differently that they can learn it and then you in turn are like oh okay that's easier and you just become like you just become a more uh well-rounded judoka and i think you just become more whole and then you're 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 just like your depth of understanding you know gets deeper i think um Mm -hmm. if you teach a lot and i i just think it's a great way to like broaden your own you know your own judo certainly your own perspective and and um just find out little things that maybe like, okay, this works for eight of the kids, but not the other two. So now we're going to do it this way. Oh, Hey, I can do that too. You know? So yeah. it's, it's cool. Do you have any yeah. more questions? I thought you brought the, the, the humbleness of judos. Like we all don't want to charge too much money. Like we talk about this with other senseis and even our own dojo. We talk about like, Oh, well this BGJ school is charging this and we only charge this. So we yeah. raise our price and they get the fearness of judo. Like, Oh, we gotta be humble. No, no, we can only charge so much. We don't like to lose people. Yeah, that drives when you me talk nuts. about, yeah, when you talk about the fundraising, it sounds like you're just talking about just doing judo clinics. Are there any other things, anything else that he does for fundraising besides just clinics and appearances? Um, well, we've done a few like raffles, um, but no, mostly it's all like, it's all, it's all judo related. It's all like clinic mm-hmm. related. Like we've done, so, oh, 
a thing that I do a lot is a donor match. So I'll try to get mm. someone to put up a certain amount of money if it's a thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars. And that to me, ha we have always had a lot of success with doing donor matches because like people say like, oh, I'm going to give this guy a hundred bucks. Well, you know what? Now I'm going to give him two hundred. And I know that that's really four. And like it just makes people I don't know, a little more excited. I feel like we've mm -hmm. just had a lot of luck with that strategy. And then like asking, you know, sometimes people want to be anonymous, but sometimes you want to like mention their business. Like, Hey, you know, pick some X business has, has agreed to do a donor match of up to a thousand dollars. So it's like good for them. And then it just like helps get the word out. So that I wouldn't say yeah. he's done too much. Um, you know, we've pretty much just stuck with, with judo clinics. I don't really know what else I could offer them. Like, I don't know, uh, you know, but <laughs> well, with what I mean is that like nowadays there's all the things about like, so Nick has his own Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does he get like, Oh, well you wear our gi, we sponsor your gis, we spend a little bit of money, yes. energy drink or yes. protein powder or whatever it is, yep. that kind of he stuff. He just had, he just like, I just yesterday closed this, uh, it's not even a deal. It's like this um, drink company, they're called Prickly. It's like a cactus water. And they're saying like cactus water is the new coconut water. And so like they messaged him because he's a, an influencer. If you have over 10,000, you're an influencer. So he has 20,000. So they they said like, hey, we want you to be part of our campaign. We're going to send you um, a case of, of Prickly cactus water. And then we're going to let you do a giveaway, which he's going to do, I think on February 1st. We're going to let you do a giveaway to 10 people to like get this stuff. But they're not giving him, uh, they're only giving him product. And so what usually happens, mm. this has happened quite a bit. And what usually happens is like, they see how it goes. And then like, if you do a good job and you generate a lot of interest, then I think there could be a paid position down the road. So it's like okay. a lot of it's not money up first. Or I think he got like um, $30 someone offered once if he, <laughs> he would like net name their product. And then like, uh -huh. he gets so many people that are like, Hey, can you shout out my uh, gym or my my whatever? And and we have to like say no now because it's so many people. Then like he doesn't want to like upset people by we say yes to these people and then no to these yeah. people. So mm -hmm. we pretty much only do it if it's like there's like a quid uh, pro quo. But it's it's, it's a not, business. You have yeah, to. It's, yeah, it it's really is. You have to. No, yeah. and going going back, to, I really like what you were just saying about charging for judo because I feel like so I went to like martial arts training when I um. I was the head sensei at Jimmy Pedro's dojo for three years when I retired. And he sent me to um, this martial arts consultant. I did martial arts training. And like the first thing the guy sat down and told us, and it was a class full of um, different martial arts club owners or, or operation managers like myself and, you know, different arts. So like karate, kung fu, whatever. And the guy said, look, everyone write down on a paper. How long have you been doing judo carry? How long have you been doing karate? How long? Have, blah, blah, blah. Everybody wrote down. It was it was double digits. Like it was some people 25 years, some people, some people 50. It was a lot. And he was like, OK, now write down like how long it takes you to get a doctorate. So if you want to be a doctor, how long would you go to school? And it's like eight years, let's say. And he's like, OK, yeah. so you all have doctorates in your field. You've invested your life into your field. You are experts in your field. You've you've committed all your time and money and effort and energy and, and you are the providing the highest quality that you can now why don't you feel like you should charge for that it's actually a disservice mm -hmm. to the whole community because it's saying like dedicate your life to this but don't make a living from it and i i think that yes. i totally um yes. am on board with that because i just think mm -hmm. that if you are doing putting all that in and giving back every ounce of you and like yeah you we are experts in our field you know and we mm -hmm. all have doctorates in judo and you know i just think that um we shouldn't be afraid to charge and look at yes. BJJ is a great example. They came after judo and they're 10 <laughs> times, a hundred million times more you know, profitable. So yeah, <laughs> it's tough to swallow sometimes, but yeah. it yeah. is, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. what, what would you say to those people who um, kind of say like, if we charge that much, we would immediately lose like half of our students. Like maybe I, they're not, they're not in a middle-class suburban area and they're in like lower income area. Well, I would say if you go to any lower income uh, area sneaker store, there's Nikes in there. You know, I would say they don't just sell, you know, cheaper stuff at, at I think, um, product is just, it is what it is. And you have to be, you can't, you know, I'm wearing these beats headphones. I can't, um, sell them to someone for a dollar. They cost $300. You know, I think it's just like, Yes, you, with that being said, we have done plenty of scholarships and you have um, certain area, if, you know, for underprivileged youth. And like I said, I was broke growing up. So my family got plenty of, uh, we were on meal tickets at school. You know, we, we got plenty of um, charity like that. 
And so I think, yes, you don't, you don't block everyone out if there's someone that wants to do it. But I think if you just charge, like, uh, let's say you're a dojo and you're charging 50 bucks a month. I think if you raise your rates to a competitive rate, which is to me, it's like around 100, 125, even, you know, I know some people, um, charge up to 250 and they're the really elite judo coaches and that, that although you are basically elite at that point but i would say a general price point is at least a hundred dollars everyone should be charging at least a hundred dollars with that being said that we don't charge that at my club forward judo club they charge 80 a month i'm always on them to charge more but um <laughs> they raised it so like i think yeah that yeah. general price point of around 100 should be the bare minimum because you're you know you ha- you have families so why should you take away from your family and not be able to put food on your table you know just because mm-hmm. you're there are unfortunately, um, you know, people that don't have a lot of money, but they, they do have other options. If they want to come and um, you can work something out with them, some sort of scholarship or discount or have them uh, help clean the mats, just that type of thing, they'll do it. And like, that's what mm-hmm. <clears throat> that's what I did growing up. And we did um, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. And you really kind of find out who wants it at that point and who's just, you know, unsure. And I, I, I find out I find that. Um, a lot of times people you do the favors for, they're like never satisfied. So it's like, if you let, you give someone a scholarship and then they, nah, they don't really come nah, they sometimes come, they're late. They don't, you know what I mean? So it's like, mm-hmm, it's good. Yeah. It's good both ways. It can kind of show you like, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to charge what I'm worth. The people that can afford it will come. And then my whole base, my clientele, um, the whole baseline will go up of who, who like I'm catering to. And then mm-hmm. for those exceptional kids, and there always are some, I was one of them, you know, I'll work something out with them, but then you mm-hmm. hope that that's your 10% instead of vice versa, you know? Yeah. I know like a problem with us sometimes that we have, um, we certainly have, we have like, we're a very cheap dojo. Like how much do we charge mm-hmm. at like 50 a month? I think we, right we now? started at 40 we're 50 now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're at 50 Which right now. Which was probably and, a huge step for you guys to bump up. Yeah. It was a big <laughs> yeah. debate to raise it. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is like with some of our people is that we have people that's been there a long time or we just have certain people that just think they're special. That's just how it is. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, I don't know if I want to pay that much. It's like, come on. You, I know you go to BGJ school. You post yeah. your BGJ stuff all the time. Yes. You're at, um, I'm not gonna mention what school, but they're all at some other school. I know how much they charge mm-hmm. there. It's like, you can't yeah. pay me my 50 but you can spend a hundred. Right. And there. I see your new iPhone and I see your Nikes and your beats headphones. And, you know, it, you can, it's really about, so when I took that martial arts training, we, we asked about people like that. Cause I was like, look, I, I was like, so anti the guy at first, his name's master McKay, but he, uh, he was right. He was great. And I, I was just, he was like, look, what you do with those, those people is you um, just start them at a very low rate and you'll see like, okay, we're charging a hundred, but you know, Anthony, you're going to charge, we're going to charge you $25 and, and we're going to put you on billing for $25. And then it's like, you make them hold that commitment. And then like, sometimes a lot of them um, just wouldn't be okay with it and they would go away. But like, I think uh, just in general, it's like the price of milk goes up, you know, like you gotta, you gotta <laughs> charge, you gotta yeah. charge, but with the that cost of living goes up. This it, is how it, it does. Is. And if you're trying to, if, if you're trying to make a living, you know, doing judo, which, which you should be able to do, then you've got to, you've got to charge appropriately. With that being said, my friend, um, Justin Smith from Wyoming. So his club is totally nonprofit. He actually charges nothing, but they have to join the Y and then, mm, um, uh, which the Y membership is like 50 bucks a year. So he's like completely that's dirt cheap. I, I mean, it's yeah. not, he's completely <laughs> nonprofit, but then his angle is, um, I think he works with like pal, the police athletic union. Or I'm yeah. not sure he'll, okay. he'll crush me if I'm wrong, but, um, I think he, he, <laughs> does a lot of um, fundraising. Like when they have Nick out for clinics, he makes the kids, um, he makes the kids like earn it. So they do this thing where they go to like Chick-fil-A or some restaurant and they make a deal with them. And it's like, okay, from two to five on Saturday, whoever comes in and says judo, Chick-fil-A is going to give 10% of the sales to um, mm. the Platte River Judo Club. And they that's how they build up their money to like bring in their clinicians. And wow. they've had, I think, um, Amory Burns out there. They've had Gerald Lafon. They've had quite a few. I think maybe maybe Neil Adams has gone out there. They've had like quite a few clinicians, and it's cool. It makes it like a a, a group thing for the kids. So yes, there are going to be nonprofit dojos, but those dojos, if you're a nonprofit, usually there's um, um, a system in place where the instructors can get paid. So mm-hmm. then you know that to me is fair as long as the instructors are. Getting paid for their time. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not That'd sure. Nice. If, I'm not sure if Johnny told you about our dojo, or you can see it in my background. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> we're, we're we're one of the dojos that have a dedicated space. We're not sharing with anyone, and uh-huh. we have we have floating floors, and oh, we have wow. gym equipment and showers, and 
people, I think if you're not going to pay, yeah, if you're not going to pay fifty dollars a month for that, which is more than what most BJJ, my BJJ school doesn't have a shower. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my gym, like, you go to LA Fitness and try to use their mm. sauna and stuff, and it's like eighty bucks a month. You know, like, I yeah. mean, mm-hmm. and and you're providing a service, and like, you know, like I said before, it, it's something that you're an expert at, that you have a doctorate in. You know, so it's like it's not like it's 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 a hard change, but once you get your you train your mind and like. We're judoka. We like to suffer. You really have to train your mind and um, and and like make a change. And I, I think you should. And I think you could. You know, I think uh, it's hard. Like I said, my our my dojo here, Fort Worth Judo Club, they're a nonprofit. And they char- They just raised their rates to eighty, which was like a big step for them. Um, also, and then they, I think they have military discounts. It's all the way down to fifty. Mm-hmm. And family second kid is forty. It's it's great. But it's like they're again, they're a nonprofit, and they are. Um, none of the it's all a volunteer thing so like the only profit making thing coming to that dojo is like now nick and i have started our own um after school program and that's how like we're how we were we started our first business we're making a great living built it from nothing just wanted to see how it would go Mm -hmm. and um we actually got the idea from our bjj friends they had like bjj after school and we're like why not judo, you know? And so, um, that's where all the money is. Yeah. And, and and like, Mm -hmm. it's a great alternative. So like our whole thing is like, say no to daycare, say yes to judo. It's a great alternative Mm -hmm. for working parents who don't just want their kids like sitting, watching like, you know, a movie for three hours in the, the school cafeteria Mm -hmm. or these, these after school daycares are like a zoo. And it's like one per every 20 kids, one adult. And it's not, you know, it's something instructive. They come, we pick them up at school in our judo van, which is super cool. And then they come to the dojo. (laughs) We, uh, we have, we do their homework, we have a snack and then we do like 75 minutes of judo and we go like conditioning the ropes and races. So it's, it's great. It's interesting. There's two parts of that question I want to ask. Um, how, did you market it to the school directly that you go like post in the school newspaper you went to the schools directly like yes yeah, so work? um what how it worked is like what uh, we just lucked out i was um we just moved to texas and i was nannying in south lake which was like 40 minutes for us mm-hmm. and i was like commuting back and forth and every day i would come in and there was this cute little blonde girl and she was always running with her mom and her mom um would just talk to me about kids. Oh, you're nannying. Like, how do you like it? Whatever. And then she'd be like, you know, you guys would be, you guys should start an after school program. She's like, I'm the gosh, I don't know what her title was. She was like the program director for this school, Harmony Schools. And she was like, yeah, if you give me a proposal, like I'll pitch it to the, to the, our board. And so like, I, I wrote a proposal and I, I wrote a curriculum for our, our school and I, um, you know, listed all of our credentials. And then we went and we did a big demo at the school and we went to their orientation um they're like schools opening next week orientation we we had a booth out uh judo after school booth we bought some um some like signs real like the really nice hanging signs and uh we in the background so of our booth like we kids were throwing each other like on the tatami yeah. already so it was really cool but we charged like double what all these other places charge they only charge like 60 70 bucks a week and it's like well, it's like four dollars an hour what they're doing, but it's like they're they get hundreds of kids and it's like it's not healthy. So we charge uh, one forty a week, which is a little over nine dollars an hour, but I think it's mm-hmm. super fair. It's like lower than the national um, babysitting rate, and I looked at like the nanny rates and all that. And so um, I was oh, like, you well, really did your research. Yeah, I t- oh, absolutely. I just I you know I don't do anything halfway. So we here's okay. our booth. And I'm like, gosh, how's this going to go? My booth here, 140 a week, right next door here is 60 a week, here's 75 a week. Why are they going to come to us? But um, at the beginning, I just needed four students to make as much money as I was making uh, doing being a part-time nanny. So I, ironically, I got four students to start. Mm-hmm. And Nick was actually at the Pan Am Games. So I'm like billing our whole program, like learn from two-time Olympian Nick Pablo. Well, he's not here right now, but he's a good yeah. you know? Does he know, about, be this? Does he know <laughs> yeah. about this? Does he know about this? Oh, yeah. He was totally involved, but he was like okay. at the Pan Am Games. And actually, I was uh. sitting in the um, – I was sitting in the cafeteria watching him fight in – where was in Peru mm-hmm. and he, he won bronze. And I was like in the cafeteria, like ah, freaking out. <laughs> Chantel, Chantel Wright was FaceTiming me from the stands in Peru. And I was like watching on her phone on my, it was crazy. But um, yeah, right. so he got back and we had four students the first week, the next week we had six. I kept getting calls and calls and we closed because of the pandemic in March and we were up to 25 students. Wow. And so it was great. And like I said, we didn't, you know, we weren't charging everyone, 
full price. Um, I did right, right off the, the rip when I approached the school, I said like uh, 20% of our students will give um, a half scholarship to, mm-hmm. but they have mm-hmm. to come from your free and reduced lunch ticket kids. So like the kids That's that are already yeah. in their system. So it's like, you, you know, they're already enrolled and there's no scam you know they're not just lying they're already like you know their paperwork's in that they're on that program yeah. so and i do and like we had a, a family of five and i like i said i'm from one of eight so i can't uh we just did give a lot of discounts but we were up to 25 people we were making um a lot of money it was completely paying for all nick's trips it was great and then unfortunately COVID happened and so yeah. we had to shut down we just opened up uh at the end of october or maybe at the beginning of october and we lost about half of our students, but ju- now it's like slowly creeping up again. So it's like the same mm-hmm. thing, but it's a lot different now because um, we have to wear masks the whole time. Mm-hmm. That's our, our state law mandates that. Um, so it's it's difficult to do judo in a mask. It's a big oh, ask yeah. from the kids, but they want to do it. And I think it's like currently, I, I hate when people say it's the new normal because like this has got to end. But like currently it is the new normal so that, you know, the masks are mm-hmm. just everywhere. They have to wear them all day at school. So um Mm. something that they're getting so over. The second part of my question you mentioned is um, that you picked them up from after school, right? How, yes. how does that work? Cause I actually, we actually had did some research into like working with a local orphanage kind of program. Oh. And I mean, with anything with judo and martial arts, it's all about liability and right. insurance, all that kind of stuff. So how, how does that work out on that end? So it, it was a lot easier than you would think. Like the, we had to all be, you know, we're all uh, safe sport certified through USA judo. We, we have our uh, USA judo club insurance, and then our club has additional insurance and the schools just have to, we do all the same paperwork basically that daycares do. So the biggest issue was we had to have a, a, a liability for transportation, a transportation yeah. liability waiver um, from the schools. And then, um, we did that. It wasn't that difficult. And then they just have to fill out the normal waivers that you would fill out for when you join a dojo. So like they would fill that all out and they do fill that out. And then they just do the, the school's paperwork. And like we, we go in their daycare line at the school. So the transportation liability was just the big thing. And then, oh, we make them all um, uh, we charge a hundred dollar deposit. And from that deposit, it goes right for your USA judo card and your judo gi. Okay. So like everybody that walks in the door is USA judo member um, for insurance Great. purposes. Yeah. And that covers transportation. Interesting. I didn't. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's a thing because you know, there's so many after school daycares. So if you're going to do that, which by the way, you totally should, it's a great idea. Mm-hmm. I love the orphanage thing. You know, Nick is adopted from an orphanage, but um, uh, you should, uh, it's uh, going to be a lot easier than you think. And you, just make sure you have that transfer. They're they're online, like, and you'll just have to modify yeah. it and have your people like modify it to put your club names in and stuff. But it's I think you should totally do it. Now, throughout this whole process, has uh, have you gotten any help at all from USA Judo, USJA, USJF? On because it sounds like the, this is something that you can take and like you're telling me this and I'm learning it. Like I think more people should know about this and um, do like you something mean help, that role like, of it. Yeah help as in information resources oh, not necessarily for, not necessarily monetary okay so um do you mean like for our after school program or just for like the like covid in general that kind of stuff oh, after, after school program like this oh, whole no, framework no. no actually they reached out to us and um we just had uh keith bryant our ceo was in town for a, a project that he's working on separate from us but he he was like hey i would love you to sit down with you and learn about your after school program. And um, at the beginning, you know, I don't know if you saw the IJF was doing, uh, they had some sort of initiative going where they were like doing a judo in the schools thing. And so I reached out to USA Judo about that, but it was like basically not a paid position or if if it was paid, I think it was like $35 an hour for the hour you're teaching and it's twice a week. Mm -hmm. So it's like not, you know, you're not, it's, you're not gonna make an income from it. But no, they've not reached out to us about it. They, I just like cat or, uh, given us any support or anything. Cause you know, there isn't, there aren't any, as far as I know, we're the only judo after school program. Um, there is, as far as I know, I know I've seen a couple other, uh, advertisements, but I don't, I haven't seen anything like if they got going, if they took off. So mm-hmm. I think we're one of a kind, I think. Um, but we, we really did our legwork and I'm hoping that maybe I can put together something that I can help, um, other club owners do. I know, um, I'm friends with Allah and Kristen Eladrisi and they are living in Philadelphia and they just started their own club. And I know they're looking to starting a judo after school program next year. And she was like, Hey, can I pick your brain? And I was like, you know, absolutely. So I, um, 
Yeah, no, no. We just we made it all. We did the whole thing ourselves, which is like kind of par for the course for Nick and I. We're always doing everything by ourselves. But I say that in a good way. It's not, you know, but um, no, USA Judo, aside from Keith's, like me bumping into him at my dojo and him saying like, hey, we'd love to talk to you and see what you guys are doing and what your program is. But um, it hasn't happened. But it, this was just like last month that I saw. I was going to say, I, I think he has his hands full right yeah, now. Probably. I think, I think <laughs> our, uh, our issue is the last thing on his mind, our, our after school program. <laughs> So there's another thing I wanted to get back to going back to the sponsorship stuff, not sponsorship, but the, the building of funds. Now, I think it's cool that you do all the, the classes and I do an after school program. It's amazing. I never thought about that one before. Is there any restrictions that USA Judo or the IGF puts on you guys about how you guys can raise money or uh, what you guys can and cannot do? So funny you bring that up. Um, Nick wanted to the IJF put out this literature that says you cannot fight in an international combat type sport, which includes BJJ, Sambo. And so we thought like, okay, international, you know, great. So we can do this. Have you guys heard of fight to win? The, yeah. um, yes. So yeah. Nick was, offered, Anthony was going to do a fight at fight to win. Oh, really? So <laughs> we had to, um, we wrote to the IJF when Nick was going to do this fight to win fight and it, it's a judo match. So mm -hmm. this is not their, their literature doesn't say, it's, it, this was a national domestic judo match and their thing says international combat sports and they declined they said no and so we called seth um and we were getting our lawyers together and we we i'm like a pro we've been a sport court like eight times we're eight no like i i know the laws so like i their ijf is wrong i'm pretty sure they can't do that but it takes mm -hmm. ten thousand dollars to hire the lawyer to win your case and set the precedent so it's like it's a big ass, but we were ready to go with Seth. Um, his lawyer is our lawyer. Uh, Howard Jacobs is the best, like a shark um, sport court lawyer. And, uh, but Keith Bryant, actually the CEO of USA Judo reached out to the IJF and he was like, right. I, I'm always like, like I go from zero to 10. And I'm like, all right, we're going to sue him. I called the lawyer. I did this. I did that. Like, no, you know, and Keith's like, hope, like he was much more diplomatic. And he was like, let me call them. And he like wrote them this uh -huh. diplomatic letter explaining more about it. And then sure enough, they wrote back and gave him permission and said, Hey, please send us film of the, of the event. We want to see like the format and what it is. So um, mm -hmm. they've not, um, they've not put restrictions on fundraising. However, Nick was paid to fight and fight to win. And that's a great way to make money, fight to win. So it's like, if you're not, and if you're not careful, they can just, you can be suspended if you don't like dot your I's and cross your T's, you know? So it's, I think, um, no, with the fundraising, I haven't heard of anything. And I just think there's no, like Nick doesn't sign a contract that he's an independent contractor. So it always makes me like so mad that they say like, oh, you can't fight. And he wants to do BJJ now. So he's just started doing BJJ. And so now I know, Probably next week, I got to go through this whole headache with the IJF again and get, write them and get them to tell me no so that I can sue them um, because I know uh -huh. that they're probably going to say no. He just wants to do domestic BJJ mm -hmm. competitions because um, it's a great way to cross train and it's like less mm -hmm. uh, less toll on your body. He's 32 now. So it's like, you know, it's just it's, he wants to do it. What's the problem? So I'm going to have to uh, do all that next week because he wants to start competing in BJJ and I don't know if they're <laughs> going to allow that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, to that headache. But I, I, I just think that like, if you're an independent contractor, you, which you are, like he pays to go to these IJF events. Like how dare you say, Oh, you can't go make money to come to come to our events. You know, it's yep. like, that's, it's crazy. So I think they're, they're learning the IJF wants to be, in my opinion, I, I actually, to clarify, I love what they're doing. I love the direction they've taken judo. I love their marketing, their branding. They're always there. Now they have like little talk shows before the live stream. When I was competing, mm -hmm. there's no live stream. Yeah, you know? I remember I mean, watching it. It was boring. Yeah, yeah. It was, so they're doing great. And I love what they're doing. Professional photographers at every event. And they, they, they're constantly like evolving and making it cool. However, some of the things that they are not doing is like, there's not, there's not a players union. And yes, I know they have like athletes reps, but it's like, much like the athletes reps that are in USA judo, it's kind of like um, just a yes man position that you don't really have any power in, but they have to do it to, you know, dot their eyes. But I think that uh, as they get bigger, they are going to be subjected to more, you know, more of the sanctions that other sports have to do. I've never heard of um, 
you know, like tennis players that they can't fight in a paddle ball tournament or something, yeah. you know? So I don't, I just <laughs> yeah, think paddle ball that fight. <laughs> yeah, the bigger judo gets, the more that stuff will iron itself out because you'll have bigger stars that want to do BJJ. They'll have money behind them and they'll have a huge platform. You know, I think Teddy Renner has almost a million followers. So let's say he wanted to do BJJ tournament and then he got his, you know, that's, it's going to happen just on its own because of, um, you know, people, uh, the, it's getting so big. They've done a great job that I think uh, that stuff will end up getting ironed out. Mm, it's fantastic. So how is the relationship with X? Since you're pretty much Nick's boss for the most part, how is that relationship with him? Is it like, Hey, is it like, honey, I need you to do this. Or is it like, no, you need to do this now fool. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, I, um, I'm so like, uh, he he's like so annoying so he he's this like never answer my phone guy never answer my phone get get you later with the email so i just like tell him to give people like my number and then if it's something like the emails and not everything it comes right to my phone and so i'm like half my day i just spend like writing people back as nick you know like as, as, <laughs> as <their Nick. laughs> clinics and whatever so it's not um it's not really a fight because like we're we're a team and like my my portion of the team is to like do all this stuff that i don't want him to have to worry about i want him to train mm. and just like you know, stay healthy, work out and, and whatever. And so there's not a lot of headbutting there, but at the beginning there was because he was shy and he was like, I don't want a website like that, but we didn't really know what we were doing at the beginning. So I, a lot of that was at the beginning. He didn't want anything. And like, I, when I first made his Instagram account, like I would have to ask him, Hey, can I post it? No, no. Like don't post that picture of me with my shirt off. Like that's weird. Like, and I'm like, and now it's <laughs> oh, like too sexy, too sexy. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Totally. <laughs> now he pretty much just rubber stamps like anything I say, because he knows like it's for the good of the company, the, the company being Team Del Popolo. So it's not, uh, there's not a lot of, not a lot of headbutting anymore. <laughs> that's great. That's fantastic. So what some people might not know, or they might know if they listened to us before, is that Anthony has a friend, Johnny. Uh, yeah. Johnny's Vietnamese, and he trains with you guys. Yes. And I guess the story is that you asked Johnny if he was going to go to USA Nationals, and he told you, no, he can't because he's not a um, USA citizen, is it? Yes. Yeah. So, so I'll tell you the whole story. Not a citizen. Story. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, no, so, go, you go ahead. So yeah. take it from there. So I, um, so Johnny, I, I love Johnny. He, um, when I first met him, he was only a green belt, but he would always show up and he was going with Nick and Ben Dyer, our, our instructor's son and Taylor Weber, all these like little studs. And he's always going with them and he's holding his own and he's like, he's doing great. And he shows up and he works hard. And um, we were like, dude, you should fight at the senior nationals. Like you're, you're really good, Johnny. Like you, you, you're dedicated. You're here all the time. And he's like, Oh, I'm not a citizen. And I was like, like right as soon as he said that i was like what because like i knew it already like i was going there in my mind i was like where, well, where are you sitting up like where are you from and he's like i'm being to me so and i was like what and then i just like immediately like right then and we weren't even now we're buddies but at the time we weren't even like that close like but right there on the spot i was like okay listen uh, we're going to contact Vietnam judo and their federation. And you're going to start competing on the IJF world tour because I've done this before. I have a friend. I don't want to say his name. I have a couple friends that are compete for other countries and they're smaller com countries where where sometimes winning one match, one match can put you on the Olympic team. So in the whole two year cycle, if you win a match at a grand slam, it's like 160 points and you're the only one from your country competing, you can make an Olympic team. And that's not, it's to me, it's not saying anything like bad about the person. It's like there he's dedicated, he's working. He didn't make the situation. It is what it is. And so immediately I was like, like spitting this in his face, like this, we're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to do that. He's like, and I, you know, he's like, okay, okay. And then like, um, sure enough, like he wrote a letter, uh, to the, to the Vietnam judo federation and they were super helpful, super welcoming, super proud to have another Vietnamese player that wanted to be like out there on the, the world tour. And he fought at the, uh, world championships later. And I think he actually fought a world champion or a world medalist, like a total badass. Oh, yeah. So like, um, yeah. I, I, Anthony, was there Anthony was there. <laughs> I was there watching. He was, yeah. he was in the audience because Anthony was gonna. Anthony was going to coach him, but because uh -huh. of there's only one coach or something, Anthony couldn't. Yeah. I, I didn't he want was to in the carry stands there though. Either. Yeah, yeah. He, um, that sucks. That he. I was hoping, like you know, you just hope you you show up and you draw. 
a, another developing country that's not so great at you, but like, it was funny. Um, but he, he's such a good sport. He's such a good guy. And he, um, I hope, I think he's going to continue to do that. And so like, I guarantee, like it would, what a cool thing if he could compete at the Olympics, like maybe not this time, but maybe in 2024, mm-hmm. like it, it, it's just like, it changes your life, you know, and it's just something you have forever. And I think it's really cool. Yeah, he worked so hard after you told him he could do that. Like he was showing me pictures of his wrists being swollen and yeah. cauliflower ear developing. Yeah, and- yeah, and here he is like this, like because he's not like he's a pretty mild guy. He's like a pretty cool, chill person, you know. And now he's just balls to the wall with all these young kids like pushing him and like they're you know you know how it is when you're training and you're just duking it out. And he was five nights a week just training, and then he was like. Uh, and I told him like, Hey, I, you, you need to be running. You need to be lifting. If you need a weight plan, let me know. And he was like doing CrossFit. He was like busting his ass. Um, and so it was really cool. It was awesome. I was happy. Yeah. He came him. out here, stayed with me for a bit. And I took him to my dojo and like, just traveled. He drove up the coast, like training at different places. It was, that's it was so great. cool. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. It's such an amazing story just to think about. Like, I would have never thought about that, you know. <laughs> I know. And well, it's just something that I, it's like a perk, like uh, it's a perk of being a friend of Carrie's is I know all this really <laughs> obscure stuff. And like literally that he just said, I'm not a citizen. And I was like, immediately, like my, my like <laughs> flare went off. And I was like, before he was even done talking, I was like, okay. Well, now, is, now that you've happen. told this and when I release this episode, there's going to be some other Vietnamese <laughs> guy that's going to compete with him. <laughs> There's some other <laughs> small country person like what what do you mean oh well, let's see what I, country i'm from I, i've helped like three or four people do this so uh reach out to me guys i will totally help you i love it i think it's <laughs> it, it can change your life and it's awesome so he's in one of the most yeah. competitive weight classes too yes so. yeah 66 yeah. is is uh, a monster it's just a monster division i mean it's so hard and there's not a lot of not a lot of easy draws there but that's judo and, and it's not really about making the Olympic team for Johnny, like for the rest of his life, he will have represented his country at a a world championships. And that's something like, you know, that I've been lucky enough to do myself three times. And it's just, it really changes who you are and and the journey of training for that. And like having that goal. And then like, you know, people are following you and they're, they're on the roller coaster with you. It's so it's like, it's, there's nothing like it, man. That's why we, that's why we do this. Right. Yeah. We're we're (laughs) actually, I feel like we're actually seeing that it's becoming more common. Like you'll notice some Japanese judoka fighting for the Philippines or Czechoslovakia or yeah, all the time. I just saw, um, I just saw, uh, gosh, I think Reiki is Philly. This Georgian guy, uh, is now fighting for, I think Slovakia. I just saw this on Instagram and he's a total badass, but the, the Georgian at 81, like just had won the masters. So, um, yeah, people are doing it all the time. And I think it's, uh, I just think it's such a cool thing that that's how bad people want to go to the Olympics. That's how yep. much it can mm-hmm. change your life. Like, uh, there's just so many people that do it, you know? And I just think, uh, if I had known, if I was like the smart and like judo savvy carry that I am now back then at like, man, God, I might've, I might've like fought for Guatemala or something, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'd be like, move the Philippines, no, no offense. Guam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no offense to any Guatemalans. I, uh, Does Puerto Rico have a team? I'm going to be Puerto Rico, all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They actually have a, a pretty badass girl. Uh, she's a world medalist at 70, but yeah, no, yeah. Mm. So I want to no, go back to the... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I just want to tell once a little funny story because this is one way of getting someone on the team like that. Way back in the day when I was a white ball in judo here in LA, uh, there was a thing where they had these terms. Mexico was looking for members for their kick, for their kickboxing, for their boxing, judo, wrestling, and taekwondo. Mm-hmm. And they had these tournaments in Texas, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and here in Los Angeles, they had one. And if you went to this tournament, you placed, like, I think if you took, if you definitely took first, you got to fly to Mexico and go compete against them to get part of the national team for the Olympics. Cool. I've never seen it done again. I've never seen yeah. it done again. It was just one time. I never saw it done again, but I was like, man, now think about that. I should have done it. I should have just gone I, to compete. Screw I it. Know. <laughs> have you seen this show? It's like, um, the, the contender series or something in the USOC yeah. is having it. Same thing. It's like, they're like having these tryouts. And I think some of their, one of their guys that they had on, cause I'm like, what? I was like, so skeptical. I'm like, what? Joe Schmo is going to go down there and become an Olympian. And sure enough, they found some like former stud athlete in high school. Sorry. Now he's going to be like a bobsledder or, or someone or something, but he's like, I think he's going to go to the Olympics. They did it. So I, I thought great. the same thing. I think, I just think the Olympics are so cool. And it's just like, uh, any way you can be a part of it, go see it, go watch it, be a volunteer, like 
Oh, I love the cameo that my cat is. Well, that's that's our plan here when it comes to Los Angeles. Me and Anthony are probably yeah. working a stand or something. Yeah, and I might absolutely. sneak on the mat. I don't know. <laughs> no, you should be sign up in advance and be like a usher or just whatever because it, yeah. it it'll change your life. The Olympics are magic. They're just so, so awesome. Do you, do you think? because of everyone moving around, like we were just talking about that eventually they should remove the country restrictions for teams outside I, of the Olympics. Well, I think they'll have to have a real discussion about it because of, uh, if it's happening, it's happening first, it was a little, and now it's like, it's no big deal to see somebody mm-hmm. switching. So I think that they will have to, especially when you're in a situation, like, I don't know if you guys watched the Moriyama Abe fight, but yeah. like mm-hmm. two best guys yeah. in the I world. I watched it like four times. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I cried. I, you know, I, so I wanted Abe to win and Nick wanted Moriyama to win. And like at the end, I didn't care who won it. I was just upset, but like, I was just like, Oh, this sucks. Like this was so hard. Situation. to watch. It was yeah. so awful to watch that. And like, I, mm-hmm. I lived that, you know, with Nick and Michael Eldred and it's a, it's, it's rough. Like, um, but yeah, so with that, and then like the Canadian girls, Klim Kate and Deguchi, both mm-hmm. number one and number two in the world, the French girls, there's always a couple girls or and guys in the top five. So I think that as that happens more and more, I hope that, um, if, if, if not, if the country restriction doesn't work out, cause I don't think it will, I, I don't think they can put a ban on that people switching countries, but I think what mm-hmm. they could do is, uh, maybe up it to, you know, multiple competitors per country. They would have to like, you know, make, make a whole new system, but they would have to figure it out. I think like the 18, the number 18 being at the Olympics is so crazy. And I think that um, hopefully in Japan will give us a big chance. Well, who knows now with COVID, but like the numbers are going to go be huge for judo. So I think as our sport continues to be um, more and more recognized worldwide, then we might have more argument to say, Hey, instead of top 18, we're going to be top 36. And if you have mm-hmm. two countries in the top 10, like they can both go or something like that. You know, I would love to see that. I think it would be fair. I mean, how can you tell Moriyama, like you're not going to the Olympics? I mean, the guy's the, the current <laughs> world champion and it's crazy. Yeah. We- I mean, that's what we talked about in our episode. We talked about like it's crazy. The current world champion is not going to Olympics. That's, just, I, that's nuts. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's uh, just not fair, you know? And then the, it's just so brutal. The one fight they didn't even, although after yeah. watching the one fight, I could see why they didn't do a three out of five. I don't think they <laughs> really, done really that to our, our match. <laughs> but yeah. That's just like, gosh, man, I hope they, I hope they uh, will adjust that down the line. Um, I want to go back to the funding issue since uh, we were t- that was the original topic that we said we we're going to talk yeah. about. What what is your stance current on how funding is handled right now through USA Judo? Okay, so in my opinion, it's handled poorly, but that doesn't mean I'm bashing USA Judo. I like USA Judo. I like Keith Bryan. I like Ed Liddy. I like all the people there in charge. They're good people. I don't think they personally are like, ha ha ha. We don't want the kids to have funding, but. <laughs> I think it's handled really poorly and I'll tell you why it's because when I was competing, I went to the 2000 junior worlds. Okay. So, but that was 21 years ago, 20 years ago. And, um, I, I think I was fully funded. I got two geese. I got, um, sweatsuit, travel bag, everything. And now it's like, you have to pay for your freaking t-shirts. Like you have to pay yeah. for the, for the national team apparel. We don't provide that. So to me, I just think, um, it's, it's really sad. And I think that they don't do what they can because they have so, you know, I think, I know they have a limited budget. So I think their issue is, well, we only have this much in the budget, so we can only, we have to focus on what we can focus on, but they're not, they're really hurting the development in our country by not having, by this lack of funds, because so many talented kids go to wrestling or they, you know, they leave our sport Mm -hmm. because they don't have 80 grand a year to spend. And I truly think that if they hired I'm friends with a few professional fundraisers. Okay. And I know how it works and I know their salaries. And it's like, why I approached them myself a few years ago. And I said, and I know other people have done this too. Okay. And I said, like, I will work for you guys to bring in sponsors and I'll only take a percentage of what I bring in what I personally, but there's, there's zero loss to you guys. It's only benefits. You guys no risk. Yeah. Yeah. And they said no. And there was no. And then because in order to do that, I think the person needs to be able to use the USA Judo logo. So I think you need to be able to with their cooperation, because if you can go to these companies and you can say and you can show the Olympic logo and the USA Judo logo, that is like, wow, that's really appealing for companies to want to donate. So you have to have their you know, they have to sign off on it at the end of the day. They have to sign off on that kind of thing. And they're not willing to. And I know that they 
have a, another guy. He's a former Olympian. I'm not going to say his name, but he offered to fund um, a full team to live at the OTC and he would pay all their expenses, but he wanted to be the coach. He didn't want it to be like, he's like, mm -hmm. look, I don't want it to be some coach who's never done judo. I will bring over mm -hmm. a Japanese coach him and I will run it, uh, you know, probably a world medalist. I don't know. And they said no to that too. So like they wow. have a history of saying no to that kind of stuff. And there must be a reason why, but I don't know what it is. Um, but mm -hmm. I really think if they hired someone on a total commission only basis, they could make so much freaking money. Like I, I know it because I know that me, Carrie, some girl who just loves her boyfriend and has, I don't know what I'm doing. I've raised like hundreds of thousands of dollars for Nick. And so like, that's mm -hmm. me, no experience, no degree in, you know, finances, no fundraising school, nothing. That's just motivated girl. And like all these, a lot of people, you know, parents love their kids and they, they would be motivated to, to do the same thing. And I just really think that if they were to um, hire someone that totally only worked off their commission and like, the sky's the limit. You know, if they're getting 10%, man, go after $10 million. You know, you're a millionaire. And it's like, there, there are so many, go after some oil tycoon or so there's so many businesses that need <laughs> oh, yeah. the write-offs. You know, you just have to, it's uh -huh. about networking, finding the right person. And I just totally think that, um, that it would change, it would change like the whole dynamic of USA Judo. I really think that our development as a country, everyone's like, well, how come we're not better? Always, always. How, where's the yeah. world medalist? And I'm like, well, how come you guys keep asking <laughs> why a bunch of kids whose parents are working like 80 hour weeks and they're like, you know, just, just to send these kids or, or like my, I use my friend Nina as an example, Nina Kucho Kelly works 70 hour weeks and still has to train and still has to pay yep. for these tournaments. Then you go to the tournament, it might, you might not even have a coach in the chair and then you're, you know, mm -hmm. you're fighting some French girl who's got an Olympic champ in her chair. So it's like two against one. And, and these other, these countries, they're all rising up and they're all pros. So it's, Oh yeah. So so, so can, especially Canada, like just now in the world masters, we just saw, yeah. saw them in the final bracket. Like yeah, it's just crushing consistently it. too. consistently crushing it. They're always, and they have a good system and they, although they do get government funding. So yeah. that's, um, you know, it's easier <laughs> said, but still, I just think yeah. that, um, that lack of, that lack of funding is just really, really hampering our, our, the next generation. And, and, you know, you have these organizations like um, project 2024 or the NYAC, but they're not, they're not funding someone to do a full-time, you know, world tour. And it, that, they don't have the funds. Like they're not funding like a guy like Johnny to compete at 15 world tour events because that's going to cost $80,000. And then like, mm -hmm. you know, then now you got, there's 14 number ones, you know, you do the math. So it's like, I think that if we, USC Judo could at least get the funding to fund the number one so that you know, okay, if I'm number one in the country, I'm yeah. going to be paid for. Now there's going to be a ton more competition to become number one in the country. And then we're going to have more depth. And then like, hopefully one day we're like France where they've got, you know, Chimeo, the 78 kilo girl's not going to go to her third Olympics because the girl in front of her is the world number one. And she's a good four. problem to have, basically. It's a good problem to have, you know, and I think it creates depth <laughs> in the country. And I think that that's really, it's not going to change. I think that, mm -hmm. um, until money uh, comes into our system and a lot of consistent money, it's not, uh, nothing's going to change. And I, I hate to say it, you know, but yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's true. I, th I think personally, I think this is, everyone's kind of focused on the LA Olympics right now and getting an athlete to that potential yeah, so medal. I'll, I'll tell you the thing, the thing with that is, um, the reason why we're so focused on that is because you get a free team. So when you're the host country, mm -hmm. you get to field all all the the weights that means that people don't have to qualify so that i mean i, I would say a medal is going to be a stretch although the olympics are crazy like a lot of things change anybody you can have a ton of surprises at the olympics so like anybody can can get hot but it's like if you're already someone who can't qualify who can't make the top 20 in the world it, it's going to be really hard for you to win an olympic medal out of nowhere you know unless you're a young kid yeah. coming up or whatever but i think just getting that getting those free 14 shots and, and having to have no one qualify, you know, it's, it's, yep. it's a chance, but it's not, I mean, it's, it would be very difficult. I, to get I a totally medal. agree. I think, yeah. I think they're a little too focused on it and something that, like you said, it's a stretch and yeah. Yeah. there, there's some long-term structural changes that need to happen now before yeah. 
where like I think as the time as time goes on, it's going to be harder to fix this problem. Yeah, you know, um, Great Britain. So what they did is even though they got a full t- uh, team, they didn't allow they said, like, you can't go. We're not going to host the full team unless you're top 40 in the world, which I thought was super cool. Like yep. it seemed like total bullshit to the athletes, I'm sure, because they were like, mm-hmm. what? But it, but you know what? They got two medals. <laughs> they got two medals, you know, like they. um yeah. And so they, they're whole and I think they fielded all 14 weights. They all 14 of their, their, everyone in the country was top 40 in the world, which is like very good. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing USA judo do something like that, but they won't, They'll, we'll just have a trials. And like, I don't know what their um, criteria will be. I'm assuming if you're qualified on the world ranking list, you won't have to fight in the trials, but if you're not, then there will be a trials for that weight. And, you know, well, who knows what they'll do. You know, mm-hmm. These proposals with the fundraisers and the, the sponsor that you mentioned, have they reached out to the other organizations other than USA judo or is it, because they need to use the USA Judo logo and name. So I, I just know that um, it's, it's not, it's not people that I know. Like I, we've, I've just like hobnobbed with a bunch of business people and they've said, they, they mentioned like, yeah, well, you need the Olympic logo. You need the logo, you need the branding. You need to be able to say Mm -hmm. team USA, U S Olympic team, USA Judo. And so I didn't, you know, for, I didn't have anyone say like, no, I'm not going to give you funding, but I just have been told that that would, that's going to be a roadblock, like getting that, getting that uh, logo and getting the support of being able to use the team USA thing will be, mm-hmm. will be huge, you know? And it's not like, um, it's just like, and I'm sure that they, there would be some paperwork or whatever. So they could say proud partner of the U S Olympic judo team. Like I'm sure they would have uh-huh. to do stuff on their end, but if we're talking that kind of dollars, like we're talking that kind of sponsorship, I'm sure they would be happy to pay the licensing, whatever fees they have to pay, you know, Coke, look at all the sponsors. We have Coke, Visa, McDonald's, all these. So if you end up, if one of these guys happened to do judo when he was in high school and, and they've got to mm-hmm. donate money anyway, and they they would throw it to judo. I'm sure they would, um, you know, fill out whatever agreements, anyway so but just not be not even having the option is just uh it just kills me but with that being said like i don't i don't just kick rocks and dwell okay we do it on our own like we do it by ourselves you know Uh and so that's something that um that you just have to know you have to know that going in and you have to be ready to to know you're gonna have to raise money you're gonna have to crowdfund you're gonna have to do all this stuff but i just think like really you're just kind of worrying about you and taking care of you. And like, that's not going to take care of the bigger problem. Even like project 2024, they're doing that, but that's not, they're not fielding anyone. I, I think they're giving small bits of money to like attend a camp. And that's the, obviously a camp's not an Olympic qualifier, but it's like, it's something and it's a start, but it's like, there's going to need to be a, a huge organization with the ability to fund 14 weight, uh, 14 athletes to 10 to 12 15 tournaments a year so they're going to be able to have to pay you know they're going to have to for hundreds of trips and so that's something that seems really far off to me unless we have like someone a professional who knows what they're doing like chasing down those dollars when, when you yeah. said they they said no to these proposals um is it like keith Bryan says no or because when i signed up for usa judo for first email i got was like oh you're now a member you, if you're a shodan rank or above you can actually vote on these like committees and kind of stuff you have voting yeah. power supposedly so yeah that's a bunch of crap the voting power it's like it's so <laughs> like the the voting it's like it's all um these boards and these positions and these stuff it's like i so i ran for athletes rap back in my day and like mm-hmm. i i'm not gonna name names here but like someone um in usa judo was like actively going around to athletes and telling them like not to vote for me and then it was like there we, we had a there was like the numbers were off because they sh- showed me the numbers and I knew that like I had 50 people vote for me and that like they said I only got 10 votes and I was like I don't think so you know anyway it was like it's all it's all uh, unfortunately a lot of uh, backdoor politics and it's a lot of just putting the right people on what the What matters committees. is who counts the vote not Yeah it, it, well that <laughs> but it's like the the people they're putting in the positions get in the positions and then for some reason they they're they don't make change and everybody goes in saying yeah. like oh, i'm gonna make change i'm gonna do this and they're not doing that but they're wearing suits at the tournaments and they're sitting up on the dais and they're mm-hmm. uh, c- content it seems like it seems like they're content with just being like this big wig in our gym or so it's so stupid to me but if something happens where um the people that get get put in on the positions either they don't have the power because they're outnumbered or they succumb to just kind of being 
politicking and unfortunately nothing ever happens and, and no one can tell me I'm wrong because what has happened? Can you say, well, wow, you know what? This athlete's rep or that athlete's rep stood up and they did this. I can tell you, we've gone to sport court five times. And before you do that, you have to go through your athlete's rep. And so like mm-hmm. we went through our athlete's rep. And at the time, this athlete's rep told Nick, they, they agreed with the other side. Like they agreed mm-hmm. against us. And we're like, how really? can you say you Dude, disagree you can't be with free us? Athlete. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. I'm like, how, but the thing is they hadn't even talked to us first. So we said right away, we were like, mm-hmm. you, you're, you're telling me that you're taking the other side here and you haven't even spoken with me yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. I want nothing to do with you. We, we went right above their head. We're right to sport court. And then we won. And it's like, yeah. they didn't even apologize. And I'm just like, man, like you, you, it's so anyway, that yeah. really grinds my gears, but um, it's that no, type it, of thing. It's a big problem. Like there's so many things that need to be changed, but no one wants to put the work into it. Yeah. I don't know if it just seems like this is too much work, just too much of a mountain to climb, but yeah, you know, we need to support our athletes. You can't expect us to get gold medals, or even placed at these big tournaments. If you're not going to support the people Period. to give them the chance to work out and train and become a full-time athlete. It's just, yeah. it's such a losing effort, but we, totally we do agree. need change, but I, I kind of hope yeah. with, the next generation, like people like our age and stuff, kind of do change things, I hope. You know, yeah, so we have I'm, a little bit more open mind. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. What I'm hoping is that people like, um, so now you know going into it, now it's like there's less of a sticker shock of like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to pay for this now. I think everyone knows that. So then like people like us can raise the next generation of capable athletes who are doing that fundraising from an early age, who are beating that drum, who are doing clinics, who are getting community support, who have that funding, even if it's not the way I would like it, which is for USA Judo to provide it. If they just have it, I'm fine with that. If they have it and they're able to go on these trips, I think that's something that like, you know, I'm contributing to now that you're contributing to now. I think that's something that we can help with is, is getting these, these the next generation ready to be fundraising you know, the next coaches to be fundraising for their clubs and to be setting up club sponsors and that kind of thing. Yeah, you're not the first person I've spoken to that feels like they're being stonewalled by their organization. And yeah, many of them just kind of gave up and left judo I th- that I spoke yeah. to. So I, I really appreciate you like staying well, with it and yeah, I don't care because it's like, what can they do to me? I'm not, I'm nothing like, I'm just, you know, I'm Nick's girlfriend. What can, what are they going to do? You know, they, gonna I just, take, like, gonna, yeah, you can't gonna, take nothing away. You're going to take our black belts away. You're going to yeah, go, Hey, I, I, give me your black belt I, back. And, and I know the system so well now, man. I know like, um, there's just a whole big process. And like I, a lot of people get afraid because they get, you know, they, they think like, Oh, something's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing's going to happen to you except for like, you're never going to be in a coach position or mm-hmm. something. But if you yeah. get, but I'll tell you what, there's a way around. If you uh, have 10 athletes on the Olympic team, then you will be, you know, so you just have to do it yourself. <laughs> and there's never say uh-huh. never. And I just, I just don't care. And I actually happen to, to like a lot of the, actually all of the people that work at USA Judo now. I have a great relationship for them. They uh, with them, they work really hard. The office people were um, they do a great job getting like Nick's info for the tournaments. There's this this girl Lauren Ramirez, but she's a uh, she's a great and it's just so I'm not bashing the individuals, but as a whole, I think that the mission is failing. And so I don't want to say like this is your fault, Keith Bryan, or this is your fault, Ed Liddy, because it's not. But it's like we got to like whose fault is it then you know what i mean like it's somebody's fault and it's 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 happening it's 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 an issue so like what is being done to correct this issue and yes you might say like well we're we're filling these other holes in the boat right now because we got to get what we can from usoc and if we don't then we might lose that and then we're really in trouble but it's like i still think you can um you could make the time to bring someone on to be a professional fundraiser. I mean, I think mm-hmm. what, what downside is it? You know, I just think, yep. uh, I don't see any, <laughs> what's the downside. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, no, I don't no. know. Um, I, I maybe more power and then the athletes have a bigger voice and then, you know, you might, but that's, those are good problems to have, you know, like mm-hmm. you, you've got some outspoken Serena Williams on your team. Like you want her on your team, you know, like you, someone with a huge platform who can like, you know, uh, not, is not okay with getting screwed and will reach, you know, so you're afraid of that. But I just think like you see judo is not really out to screw anyone. I th- just think they're not doing a great um, job with the fundraising. And I just think uh, any year, any issue that's decades old, there's, there's gotta be, you know, someone's got to put their thinking cap on there and get, get that solved because like, this isn't, this isn't something that just happened. This has been happening. Like, it would, no matter who's in charge also, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It's like whoever is ends up being in charge They're They're not doing it. Where is the funding? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like all for the last, for the last 13 years, only four or five athletes have gotten funding. 
you know, the, the athletes have switch. It's been, you know, here and there, but that's that, that it's like, it is terrible. I mean, it's, uh, how does that, I don't even understand how that even works. That's a pot. Like that's, it's, it's a crisis. Like I, I mean, it, a lot of, a lot of people agree with us, but at the same time they think USA judo has all of this money. But if you actually look at their balance sheet, no. it's actually not yeah, that they much. don't, they don't have any money. As a matter of fact, Keith Bryant. So we were in the red for like years because mm -hmm. uh, Jose Rodriguez was like, just doing a lot of shady business stuff, yeah. a lot of kick, lot of kickback <laughs> deals for himself, a lot of, a lot of using the credit card for personal expenses, that kind of stuff. But, um, but Keith Bryant, to his credit, he came in and I think in his first three months, he got us in the black and we've been in the black ever since. And I, and I do know there's a difference, like, um, certain athletes can like submit expenses and try to get them reimbursed or whatever. And, and they're all of a sudden like um, that process changed where they're like, no, we only cut checks on Fridays. You have to speak to our accountant. You have to fill out this form, this form, this form. And I appreciated it. I liked it. I was like, Oh good. There's mm -hmm. something's happening. Accountability, over there. Yeah. There's accountability is happening over there. Um, and I don't think that Keith is like, you know, go into Hooters with the, the company card or anything. I go to Vegas, maybe. I don't know if I go to Hooters. I'm, yeah. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. All right. <laughs> I'm going to Vegas. Yeah, I, I think that uh, they're they're working hard. I just think that they, they I don't know why that they are not focusing on the fundraising thing, but I, I wish they would, you know, for our, for our children's children, I wish they would, you know. <laughs> the future of American judo. Come yes, on. Yes, man. It's just, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I have a couple more questions. I know we're like over an hour now. If you, oh, I don't even, I don't even notice. It's okay. Nick just walked in. Yeah. I thought he was going to be back like two hours ago and he's okay. playing video games over there. Uh, um, <laughs> so we just did an interview with uh, the three federations about the AJDM and I'd like to get your thoughts on that, on what they're doing mm -hmm. with the American judo development model and what you think about it. Okay. So I, um, I just know what was published. I just know like what I saw the same thing you saw probably mm -hmm. that was put out. I think it's a great idea in theory. I think that, um, judo Canada has something similar. I don't know if you've seen their development yes, model. Um, yeah. so I, I just think it's a great idea in theory, but I, I need to see like what comes of that. I think there needs to be like status updates, status reports. I think that, um, that, not even just so like people can meet to be like, Oh, you're not doing enough. Just to hold yourself accountable to see like, what have we gotten done? Out back, of, you can look yeah, back and, and, see, and yeah. track your progress. Like I, um, when I was competing, I always used to, I didn't evaluate after each tournament, but I would look back at my six months, every six months. And I'd be like, okay, did I improve mm -hmm. in the six months? And I think it's the same thing with the, their, um, judo development model. I think that, um, it looks good on paper, uh, how are we going to implement that? Like, what are they going to do so that each of the clubs the, all, all across the country that we're all conformed and doing this system, because just putting it out there isn't really doing anything. Now, if you say, Hey, we're going to give each club a $10,000 entry fee limit. If you follow this thing and send us in reports and da, 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 da. Yeah. I mean, then I could see everybody doing it, but like what, um, why would uh, a volunteer sensei who's probably really busy and works two jobs, like well, why would they now start doing all that extra paperwork and all that extra work if there's no one following up on it and they don't really understand why they're doing it. So I think yeah. that um, I'd like to see, I'm curious to see how that will be implemented. Um, but I don't really know much about it to be honest, other than the, you know, other than the, the thing that they put out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, only I, have one, that. I only have one more question, but I'm going to let Juan uh, shoot some more questions. If you have any. No, no, I'm I good now. I, I, think we got, I think we got a lot of stuff done right now. Okay. We got a lot of fun answers. So, They're a fun <laughs> interview so far. So, awesome. so, I, so I actually brought this up many times to different people on uh, and previous episodes, but have you looked into non-traditional fundraising methods? Like, for example, um, I, I love to use volleyball as an example because I started seeing oh, his, them. Oh, his volleyball one. He always brings this I, up. I don't like time. volleyball. I <laughs> personally don't like volleyball, but okay. um, have you heard of a platform I called see, Twitch? Judo players topless playing volleyball. No, <laughs> no I'm joking. Uh, I'm joking. <laughs> yes, I have heard of a platform called Twitch because Nick has just started a Twitch because I, I, I do not discount ask. anything. He uh, uh -huh. has his own channel. He just did his first cash out he cashed out a hundred dollars and I, I don't know Woo. if you if you know about twitch you can't cash out until you hit that hundred dollar mark mm -hmm. so he just did his yeah i think twitch is a great uh outlet i think it's so nick is a big gamer like he's standing yeah. over there and he's wearing a hey nick come here come stand behind me <laughs> i don't know this um you guys are gonna know this sweater right away 
I don't know. This is a big uh, see what he's wearing. Oh, dragon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he's a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned the light on for me too. So yeah. Anyway, he's a gamer. So that's something that he um, that he does that he he is passionate about and that he's good at. And it dri- actually drives me nuts. But like he's the one that came to me. You know, all these years. I've had, I've come at him with so many, we're going to do this. You're going to stand on your head. You're going to go on a date with this judo mom. No, I'm just kidding. I'm like, you're going to do all this. But he uh, came to me with the Twitch thing and he was like, Hey, I think we should do this. And I know nothing about gaming, but I know about fundraising. So I was like, yes, yes, Mm -hmm. do it, do it now. And then like uh, to get verified, you needed like, I don't know, whatever number of followers he did it, like he did it. And and, like, then he, so I'm following along and uh, he's just started. I think that any form of fundraising whether it's non-traditional or not i don't care what you do if you're good at it and it'll make you money do it do it 10 times more than you're doing it you know like i I think it's a great idea there are are a few ufc athletes mma fighters that actually game on twitch and they get i know yeah so they they Mm -hmm. get money that way because unless you're huge you're actually not making that much money after you pay your trainers and your gym and all that kind of stuff yep but, i uh, and that's my sponsorship yeah my dream is that he'll you know rake in the millions playing on twitch uh <laughs> i don't what's he playing what's he playing on twitch right now he plays fortnite and he plays what else do you play on twitch well, well now that i have a new gaming pc i'm gonna play just about everything but i like all the blizzard entertainment games he likes all the blizzard uh, entertainment okay. games i don't know uh, okay I mean. so, so like world of warcraft starcraft world of warcraft, world of warcraft. Yeah. Yeah. Hurtstone. Uh, yeah. I like Fortnite. I guess COD, but I stink at it. Um, uh, Fall Guys was boring now. Fall Guys uh, boring. Okay. Any any game where uh, is like a fighting game, like any Street Fighter, Dragon Ball Z. Oh, uh, you should you should do collaboration game. with those those kind Mortal of Kombat. fighting game communities. He said you should collaborate with those kind of fighting communities. Like you should. Uh, oh yeah. Well, I just. I'm not a very good verbalizer, so. <laughs> well, that's your cue. That's your cue. That's what he has you. That's what he has you here for. I need to, I need yeah. to up my, my Twitch game. <laughs> yeah, the, the fighting game community is really tight knit and they have mm-hmm. a really dedicated following. So if you can like get him an in there, you can. I'm sure. He, well, his handle is sort of slick Nick 89. So what? Oh, he's going to change it. Okay. Well, okay. Edit, let edit us know what cut, you cut. change it to and then i'll add it in a description okay, okay so. i will yeah and he's yeah. at nick for gold like the word for not the number mm-hmm. for on instagram <laughs> and twitter find him on facebook follow him everywhere have him out your club he's yep. the best clinician in the country in my opinion uh yeah but yeah but what, the, what i was trying to say is it's twitch and youtube <laughs> and all these things are such an underused platform like volleyball yeah. it's not just the players streaming but they hold like out here in la and manhattan beach and hermosa they hold the AV, avp um tournament it's like kind of like think about nationals and yeah i like, went to one they ha- they held one in uh, uh some sort of event it's called the five championships in fort lauderdale yeah. we we went and watched we saw uh phil Dal- Dal- yeah. Dal- they, you know, they cool. streamed that on twitch every year Oh, that's so cool. That's yeah. such a good, see like that to me is where USA judo is lacking. Like no offense to, to Eddie and Keith, but, that, but I don't think they spend a lot of free time on Twitch, you know, and they need to up their, <laughs> their social media game, you know? And I think that yep. they uh-huh. have, they've gotten better, but like Justin Flores. So um, obviously you guys are familiar yep. with Justin. He was a, our national coach for the last four years. He is so social media savvy and he did a lot. He brought, he upped our game a lot, but he still mm-hmm. wasn't in control of the social media. So it was like a lot more content got put out, but it was like what he sent them, what they picked from that to put out. Like, yeah. I wish they would have just given him the codes to everything because he yep. was just like, bah, 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 bah. but I think mm-hmm. that that is another totally underutilized um, area for USA Judo. And that's another w- w- way where we can be making a ton of money. They never do any like Facebook lives. They don't do mm-hmm. any, hardly any Instagram takeovers. It's like once or twice a year. And it's just like, they mm-hmm. need to be doing that every month. And like our giveaways, Olympia- no ask a clinician. No- <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can hear him. Yeah, it, yeah it's heard just him. it's frustrating because like our Olympians, like if you're an Olympian, you're probably in really good shape. Which by default, you're probably a good looking guy or girl. You know, you're in good shape. You work out all day long. You probably look good in a bathing suit and like pictures of you in the gym working out. It's gonna get, it's gonna get viewers. You know what I yeah, mean? Like yeah. you I see mean, that they, on they, Twitch now, like work working yeah. out advice yeah. and programming yeah. yeah yeah i just think our numbers would go way up you know mm-hmm. if we uh let hannah martin like take over the the yeah. uh 
the Instagram takeover yep. and like showed her workout, you know, like it's just like, or, or, or whatever, you know, the, the let Nick do some kind of n- geeky nerd gamer thing on there. And like, yep. there's a huge community for that too, you know? So um, no offense to geeky nerd yep. gamers. In comparison, <laughs> the, the one time I watched the USA nationals live streamed, they're using some sort of, proprietary platform that was oh they're they're crap. yeah their program's and terrible it's so it's, bad it's it's freezing you can hear the audio from mm-hmm. like matt too if there's audio at yep. all it's it's mm-hmm. horrible i mean it's so bad like i could i could hold my phone and do a better job yep. like i yeah but then yeah, the thing is that there's so many ways to stream stuff now they could have put a, a better program on youtube they could have done it on um what's the one that Facebook used? Whatever. The one's Facebook. Facebook there's just there's so many yeah. ways Facebook, yeah, Facebook Live, live yeah. and stuff mm-hmm. to show all these tournaments. You put it on Twitch to show all the big, like American tournaments, at least, you know, to build up our athletes and make them into stars. Yeah, I Instead totally making, agree. I think that yeah. is a huge part of like, if they did that and we did, if they were stars, then they would in turn be making more money. And then maybe you, and then that, the trickle down effect happens. Like, man, mm-hmm. I, I, um, I know it really chaps Justin's ass, the the social media thing. He's like, man, like we're doing nothing on social media here, you know? And it's just like, it was uh, because it's such a, it's, it's free marketing, free networking, free. Mm-hmm. And, and you are USA, you know, you get to say hashtag team yep. USA. You yep. get to say Olympic team, you know, use the word Olympic. You get to do all that, like do it, you know, like, again, mm-hmm. that's something that I would do for free for them. So um, if you guys are watching, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Twitch has Twitch has a demographic that the judo community is looking for too, like kids yeah. in their yep. teenage age. Yeah. And if they worked out a partnership, they just slap your tournament stream right on the front page. When you hit yep. twitch.tv, it loads up yep. and it's auto plays the yep. tournament. And people, that's what happened with volleyball. People are like, oh, there's a volleyball tournament going on. You God. watch this. Yeah. That's so, so people cool. who know nothing and- about judo will get exposed to it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. judo is like, we can cater to that like anime community. Judo's cool. It's fighter guys yep. and geese, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. it's cool. Like, Big oh, throws are fun to look at, you know? Yes, Junior yes. Waz is fun to look at. Yep, it's uh, it's so exciting. I'm honestly, I'm such a judo fan. I think judo is so cool. And I think that, um, I think like if more people saw it, they would like it, you know? I just think mm-hmm. if, if we're not out there, so. No. But that's that's uh all of my questions so, so. <laughs> no i think well, it's great questions <laughs> awesome i had a great time talking to you guys so uh thanks so much for having me and yeah. uh just let me know where i can yeah thank you for doing this uh, do you, is show. there any shout outs or more uh marketing <laughs> stuff you no, want no just follow nick at nick for gold uh just find him on facebook uh at facebook.com slash nick del poplo he's got a youtube page nick del poplo he's he's got uh twitch which currently is sort of slick nick 89 but might be getting changed so to a cooler okay. name i wasn't really down with the that that name he picked it <laughs> <laughs> actually he hates nick for gold the, so at the very beginning uh when we first got his twitter and instagram and stuff we were working with this guy frank shamrock the mma fighter mm-hmm. yeah and frank was like uh you got to pick like, he's, he's like kind of far out, you know, he's like, you gotta like, uh, you're going for the gold. You're going to be Nick for gold. And so like he did it and now all his accounts are verified and I can't change it. And it, it, like, yeah. he hates it. Like he hates it so much. So I, th- I think it's a pretty good name. It's easy to remember. So. Yeah. I like it too, but it's like, uh, you know, when he's retired and stuff and he's just a coach, I don't know what I, uh, it'd be better if it was like, <laughs> well, you know what though? A lot of people do their weight classes and now he's changed weight. So I guess it would have. Yeah, that's yeah. another one people always do. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, I just had a blast. I, I, you know, I didn't even uh, look down. I'm looking now that it's 505 for me. Yeah. And I didn't even I could just talk forever. Like I just didn't even notice. Like, we need to do this get, again sometime. Uh, yeah, yeah, anytime. Get me going. And uh, and I can't I won't shut up. <laughs> well thank you really appreciate this if anybody wants to please follow nick please look up them please support them please support usa judo and helping our athletes okay awesome thank you. thanks guys thank you take care <sighs> what a great interview that was that was a long Anthony, one but it was really enjoyable right like uh, I, I think- I, I, if i didn't keep track of the time on the phone which i started yeah. making a habit of because we we tend to drone on and on if we don't plan out the questions uh, yeah yeah, it was long interview. We, we have to do that again sometime. Now it was a great interview. We got a lot of information, a lot of ideas of how to promote judo and how to build judo in the United States. And even how to build some judo around the world if you're from a smaller country that needs some ideas of how to build it. I think we had to come up with some good stuff today. Yeah. Uh, 
leave us a comment on what you think, uh, whether you <laughs> want to ask more questions next time we bring Carrie back on. Uh, Cause we, we mostly just talked about funding and marketing and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. maybe we talk about something different next time, like teaching methodologies. Cause she seems like she's been having a lot of um, experience teaching classes for kids and after school programs. I want to pick her brain a little more on that, especially since the program's still kind of new, I want to like, wait like maybe a few months out when things mm -hmm. settle down and see how the how the program grows really curious about that well we should actually have people over again once the covid's done around the united states yeah, she's just talking about classes started. yeah <laughs> yeah all right so please everybody remember to like share and subscribe you can follow me at the g one underscore juan on instagram you can follow anthony at anthony throws on instagram Follow us on YouTube. If you like anything, please, this, if you want to ask us anything, send us any questions, we always like listening to you guys, hearing you guys' stuff out there. Leave us a comment and please follow. Right. Talk to you guys later. <laughs>